boxing and the world beyond coming at you once again we got victor castro in the house oh. directing us in the studio and we got our very special guest we had to bring him back again because he's the best we actually he should be here every week we got hector martinez in the house i don't want to call him a coach i don't want to call him a trainer i call him a teacher of boxing good evening everybody what are they well we talked about the fight Daniel Jacobs versus Saul Canelo. You know, it's funny because I look at the promo for all the Canelo's fights, and it's always Canelo versus so-and-so, right? I think that's the first fighter that his his nickname is is his is his promo name. You know, it's like not even Ali that they just, well, they did Ali, but it's his last name. So it's not like Alvarez versus Jacobs, which is, you know, that's the way it's supposed to be, right? Yeah. But you never had like marvelous, like marvelous Marvin Hagler versus it wasn't marvelous versus Sugar Ray or you know marvelous versus Leonard. Yeah. Canelo gets True. such goddamn props, you know, with the, with the promos and stuff that this guy got his nickname on there, you know. But what you think, Hector? Did he live up to that? I thought yes. I thought that I was a true believer that the skills were going to overcome on this on this on his opponent. Skills that, pay that, the that, bills. That had. You know, enormous size over Canelo. I mean, Jacobs, tall, long, strong looking, but skills overtook the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, know um, skills pay the bills. You know, um, his his waist movement was lovely. You great. Know? You know? That was good. And, you know, I'm a person who always advocates for a, a skilled boxer. And Canelo got out there and, he reached a moment where he got so confident that he stayed right in front of him and yep. started slipping punches yep. where he was slipping four, five, six punches at a time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what kind of confidence could Jacobs have after something like that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that, 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 you know, when you miss one or two at that level, it's, you know, you're, that's normal. But when a guy is right in front of you, he's got his head in the pocket, and you throw five, six shots and miss with every one of them, and the threat of his power is right there, yeah, it's unnerving, you know, and round after round. I mean, you know, Canelo was, you know, of course, some of those punches from Jacobs landed, but for the most part, Canelo's defense was, was the reason why I don't agree with Marquez and a lot of these guys who are very pro-Jacobs after the fight, you know, in a sense saying that he won. You know, I, I thought he won by about four rounds. I mean, two of them were closer. But, you know, I, I thought Canelo dominated the fight, you know. I thought so, too. I really didn't count the rounds, even though we know that the fight is scored by counting the rounds. But I just noticed that Canelo fe- looked like he was in control most of the time yeah. throughout the whole fight. He, 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 he was, stayed right he in front of him. Pushing to him, mm-hmm. you know. Now, now. When a champion in today's era of boxing looks like the challenger, you know, that's a rare thing, man. You know, most of the champions let the challenger come to him because it's easier to defend the castle than to attack it. So Canelo goes right in. He's fighting like a challenger because he went to Jacobs, Uh you know. He made the fight. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, Jacobs, you know, no slouch whatsoever. Um, His defense was tight, too. You know, Mm -hmm. very tight. Um, but just not a lot of... Uh, his accuracy on his offense, and that's what I noticed prior to the fight. What you said, yeah. Yes, I said to myself, this guy throws a lot of shots, but how many of those really land on the yeah. target? Yeah, and, and you're wasting yeah. a lot of energy. Yeah. That's right, and, and the guy knows it because he's pressing the fight, and, he's, and you're not hurting him, so he keeps pressing it and pressing it, and, and you know your confidence is growing, and you're not nervous about getting landed on. You know, and that just t- makes the bigger guy, the sm- it makes the smaller guy the bigger guy. Yeah, especially like there's, a, there's, you know, the the idea is to throw a combination where punch one, punch two, maybe even punch three are part of the setup to create, you know, a hole for punch four or punch five. Well, Jacobs did like a five or six punch combination in round three or four. And the crowd got impressed, but nothing landed substantial to anything. He was hitting elbows, arms, and shoulders. It, it was like it, it, nothing substantial. So, yeah, like you say, he just throws that mass without an actual target, target zone in sight. You know, That's right. Because no- you, you guys should- had, I was going to say, you guys mentioned on the last podcast something interesting. 
where uh, Coach Art was talking about, sometimes they'll throw things to to wear the body out where it doesn't wear out right then and there, but later on. Yeah. And then also you were talking about the psychological part where he's doing by being the aggressor, he was un, it was unexpected, so it threw his game off as well because I didn't get uh, unfortunately I didn't get to see the fight, but I heard a lot of screaming going on where we were at this casino. Yeah. And so, do you think it was a combination of using some of those old school methods, or I mean, what do you think? Basic boxing, basic boxing. He stood right. Canelo stood right in front of him. Upper body movement didn't get landed on, and he was landing the better shots. He can, one thing about Canelo, he's really improved hitting the target. Yes. He throws a punch to a certain area, he lands it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and that's why he's effective. He throws on the left yeah. side. He throws on the right side. He throws up the middle. He's effective. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So you're the bigger guy, and you're getting landed on, and then you're throwing. The bigger guy's thrown to the smaller guy, and you're not landing. So which way is this going? You know, little by little, he's huh. chipping away at the big rock. Yeah. and But uh, but to answer your question about, you know, I, I, I always like Teddy Atlas's uh, way of putting it, putting water in the basement. You know, you're flooding the house, you know. Logging, blogging, you know, you know, getting somebody feeling heavy by the end of the fight. That's what body shots do for the most part, mm. you know. And Jacob's defense was good enough to not let Canelo put a lot of water in there. You know, as you know, if you watch it, they're both pretty fresh in round 12. And oh, that, wow. that is my complaint about today's interesting, you know, fighters, period. You know, I had I had watched the day before. Ali versus Norton, too. Twelve rounder. At the end of that fight, Ali walks to the corner, and he's so exhausted because he put everything he had into it, you know. And he's so exhausted. Bundini Brown tries to go and like you know give him a hug. He throws a punch at his own cornerman. Huh. He throws a punch at Bundini Brown like get away from me. Like I need air. Like you know, leave me the fuck alone. You know. I mean, that's exhaustion. You know, that's tired. That's putting your all into it. Both of these guys were very energetic at around at the end of the, when that twelve, you know, bell rang. It was like you know, so like I, I trip on these guys that you know they want the title, right? Well, but they didn't leave it all there. You know, Jacobs uh, had spots of that where he wanted it, and and you know, and the rest of it he was letting Canelo you know build his own you know moves. And the thing is, is that. You know, you want that title, man. Every second of that fight, you should be able to fight. You should be you should be on that champ every second of that fight. Do you think he was saving it towards the end to see if he could put that extra boost in, or at their at their level of years of boxing, they have the experience to know how to gauge the right. gas. You know, yeah. and um, you shouldn't leave anything there, man. That's your shot at the world changing for you. That's a shot at you winning the world title and being. One of the elite fighters of history, and you know, or you know, not that he hasn't had one, but it's just we're talking about this is the, the you know the fight that makes you the man to beat the man to beat the man to beat the man all the way back, you know. Um, and I think at the end of it all, you know, he might be, you know, he didn't give it his all, his all, you know. Leading up to the last two rounds, that's when they sh the guy behind should be putting the pressure Going. on. Going. I got it. two rounds to go. I'm behind. This, I have to go leave for it. it. All you there. have to start. If you're a real champ, at that point, you need to start taking risk. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Go for it. Because hey, you're man. losing. Hey man, go. You, you want to talk a fight similar to this, but unsimilar in the sense that we talked about it last week. Tommy Hearns Dur and Sugar Ray. No, Duran and Barkley. Okay. That's the same size difference. Five mm -hmm. seven to mm -hmm. six. Whoa. Duran's mm -hmm. five seven, right? Mm -hmm. That's Canelo. 5'8". 5'7", 5'8". That's Canelo. You know, Barkley's 6... Uh, Jacob's 6. Same size difference. That's a reach. But go watch Duran. He mm -hmm. ain't resting for shit. Every second mm -hmm. of that fight, he's doing something to make something happen. Even when he's not punching, he's doing something to make the other guy think there's something about to happen. And something did happen. I mean, it's like he's everything. There's a fight every second of that fucking mm -hmm. it was fight of the year for a reason. In a, in a great right. era, in a, one of the last great eras of boxing, you know. I mean, Canelo, uh, you know, I'm not knocking him. You know, a lot of people went Canelo blasting after this. You know, all, even Triple G said it was a sparring match. 
Hey man, Jacobs. <laughs> Jacobs was there at the end of their fight too. Him so, by Canelo boxing made it, that's what good skill makes it look like. Good skill makes a hard fight look easy. Yes, yes. because you're using tactics, using skill. Now, okay, every fighter has a different style, a different flavor that they bring. Whether it's you know some guys are really outgoing and they're in your face, other guys are a little quieter and they kick your ass or and so, do you feel that this fight was a reflection of the training, or of the fighter, or both? Or what do you think compared to some of the other, like the, the Barkley uh, Dur Duran fight? I think in this one, Jacobs, he thought that he was just going to be able to get out there and use his reach, okay, which he doesn't know how to use it effectively, okay? No. Um, and Canelo just, he knew he had no other choice but to go out there and box this guy. Otherwise, he was going to get a licking, mm. okay? With a guy that big... You had to know what you were doing to survive 12 rounds with this big guy in front of you and don't get hurt. And he did it the whole fight. He got yeah, caught a couple it, times, yeah, but it, it's, he it's, survived yeah, very I mean, well. It, it's he, left, only, he left the ring clean. Yeah, it's only natural that he'd get caught you know, in there but because he was taking the risk of being in the pocket. And, you know, for all these Canelo bashers, look, I'll tell you first and foremost, I'm, I'm sort of with uh, Nacho Berestein. I criticize... I've criticized Canelo for not having more technique than he does. So I've been a critic of Canelo in that sense, but I can't criticize him, man. Jacobs came in definitely over 180. This guy's practically a cruiserweight if, if he wasn't really, a, if, you know, because I mean, he might have been in 185 somewhere around me. He looked big, man. I mean, it was another size creature in there. Do you think that you know? is what kind of slowed him down a little bit from doing his best? No, because really he doesn't belong at middleweight no more. Mm. I mean, he, he, after the fight, he made a good decision. The next day announced that he will not ever fight at 160 again, that he's going to go to super middleweight or light heavy, which obviously, you know, I mean, see, today's, weigh-in system and today's knowledge and nutrition allows for a cheat that wasn't possible in the old days you know like barkley didn't come in at no 180 when he fought duran you know they weighed 160 the day before because they were already doing the day before weigh-ins and the smart thing back then because nutrition knowledge was different was to not let yourself gain more than six to ten pounds because you'd become absolutely lethargic. Absolutely true. You become absolutely. lethargic. I'm still a believer of yeah. that. Right. I'm still stuck in that era yeah, yeah. where if it's my fighter, let them go eat. Let them go pig out. But you're going to come in light because you're going to be more efficient. Yeah. Okay? You're going to be lighter, quicker. You know what I'm saying? You're not going to go in there and gain 15 pounds. That's no, like saying, hey, no. let's go eat dinner, and after that, we're going to go for a run. You, you want to go for a run? <laughs> Heck no, right? No, no. So you want that body to be light. Yeah, no more, you know, 6 to 10 pounds. Anything more mm -hmm. than that, you're, just, you're making a lethargic body. Yeah, you're putting on a, a backpack. But today's guys, mm -hmm. you know, there's nutritious, there's, there's cheats that they're using. Even some guys are even, you know, redoing their blood. They're, you know, uh, there's so many cheats out there, man. You know, and they, they can't test for everything either. You know what I mean? Some of these cheats are not even, you know, steroid cheats. Some of these cheats are just, you know, smart ways to, you know, let your body dry up and fill up in 24 hours. You know, and that's not great for your health either. I, I'd say to avoid all of this same-day weigh-ins like the old days, and that'll kill all of that shit. Same day weigh-ins. You weigh in the morning of the fight. That's it. Because what? nobody could gain 20 right. pounds that that's day. Right. Why do you Why you know? do you think that's changed? Well, they changed it before because... Health reasons. People took advantage of that shit back then for the opposite. The th ways that were dangerous for fighters. Fighters were taking dangerous risks to make that weight and coming into the fight dehydrated. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, let's give them a day to hydrate to make things safer. But there's always some assholes who are going to just do shit wrong. You know, it's just no matter how you do it. But I'd say it's, 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 it's every bit as much a risk to have a guy like when Joey Gamash fought uh, with um, um, Gotti. You know, he won the lawsuit because literally Gotti came in 25 pounds bigger. It's a lot of weight. And when he hit him, I mean, the guy went down like he got hit with a bat, you know. <laughs> He won the lawsuit, you know, against New York State uh, Commission because it's, you know, I mean, it was <laughs> that's a lot of fucking weight. So you, know? you got two great fighters. One is smaller, one is taller, and he's got the reach. If you each were coaching the fighters, what would you tell one 
to prepare for for the other? And how would you prepare your fighter with the reach to maximize that? Best, that best, seek, the best way the to that is what should have Jacobs done to use his reach advantage? Yeah, reach. Fight? Stay sideways. Yes. Okay? Yes. Stay sideways and shoot the shoulders. Yes. I could give you the perfect display on how a guy with shorter reach can outreach the taller guy. Hmm. All right? And I could do it with everybody. Okay? But that little lesson there, 99% of the coaches don't show that. Yeah. And, and, and there's, 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 there's one using mobility. To cut over. See, most of these fighters, when they're not punching, they understand how to turn the opponent. Because if the puncher's got to turn his body, he's not going to punch at that point. He's going to set his body before he punches. Well, in the old days, you were taught to jab and step over at the same time. And for that split second, even a shorter reach guy has a reach advantage because he's cutting in the angle. Mm -hmm. And the other guy is also a step behind and turning to him. So for a millisecond of time, you have more, more reach. More reach, and you're a step ahead of your That's opponent. That's good. I was, I was looking at some of Coach Art's videos, and he, uh, he had uh, this young lady that he's training her. You were, she, you were having to work on just that. Jab, yeah. jab, and, yeah. and step. Yeah, yeah. And then she yeah. was on it. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, you know, it, we're 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 both of the same mentality that, you know, I mean, skills pay the bills, man. You know, so, it's like we love brain cells, and if you, you're if a fighter's in your care, you're caring for a lot of things, but nothing more important than those brain cells, and everybody's gonna get hit, so you want to minimize that to the fullest capacity because that is that person's life. You retire from boxing at a young age. It's pretty fucked up if by 35 your brains aren't working well enough for you to live a competent life for the rest of your life. You know what I mean? It's pretty, and we've seen it. We've seen a lot of, you know, guys that weren't cared for, didn't get taught appropriately how to use proper defense to keep their brain cells safe. They just you know? survived on being tough. Yeah. And working hard. Yeah. You, you guys talked about at the last podcast about Jimmy Lester. And he, I mean. And he was, walked into a lot of punches, too. He, and he yeah, was he taught did. better than most guys today. But it was a tough time. It was yeah. a tough era. He I heard he got ruined after he left Don Stark. Because yeah. Don told yeah, me. Yeah. He said when he left me, he wasn't the same guy no more. They were putting in, putting him in over his head. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that, that, that mm -hmm. can go bad. You know, even most of the damage is in the gym. You know, the sparring, and, and that's where most of the damage for fighters are, especially with bad teachers, you know, the trainers, I'll call them, you know. Trainers can train, you know, a SEAL, you know, but f training a boxer, you need a teacher. Yeah. You know, even Bernard Hopkins recently said it. All the good teachers have died, <coughs> and there's not enough good teachers around anymore, you know, in boxing. Do you guys feel with your experience that some of these boxers <sighs> that have all this natural skill and they have a great, coach slash teacher slash trainer how many people have you seen in the history of boxing that they had so much potential but they were too hard-headed to follow a good coach's guidance a lot of them a lot of, yeah you see that every day them. today mm -hmm. yesterday yesterday the, the know. champion isn't always the best fighter mm. he's the one that stuck to it disciplined himself keep to the mic yeah disciplined himself and Follow through what he believed in himself. There could be other fighters with all the skills, but maybe they got involved in other things. They didn't have the discipline. So they didn't make it to the top. Were they better than the guy that's at the top? Yeah. But they'll never find out because they didn't stick to it. Discipline's a tough one. Mm -hmm. You know? It's, one of the, it's the key. I yeah. knew uh, I was hanging out at a certain neighborhood bar. I'm not going to mention the fighter's name or anything. Very talented. But before a fight, he was hanging out with some folks that we knew and doing some things he shouldn't have been doing. And I thought, I wasn't judging. I was just saying, if I was, because I know how hard it is to get in shape. You know, if you could see me, I'm big sexy right now, but <laughs> it's hard to stay in shape. And, right. and when you're getting ready for something like a prize fight, you really have to take it seriously because it's an opportunity and you have to, like what Coach R was talking about, it's brain cells. If you're not on your 100%, you could get hurt. And this guy, he wound up not winning. And I wasn't surprised, but I thought, why would you take a chance with so much that's been, you've invested a lot of time with discipline and training and nutrition and 
But sometimes that 2% of our mind that pulls us in the wrong direction, getting the things we shouldn't, you so eloquently put, yeah. you know, and but that's kind of the boxing world because some of the guys come from some tough neighborhoods. That's, that's, that's everything. everything. Everything's a microcosm of everything. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. boxing is no different than tennis. It's just circumstances are. But, mm-hmm. you know, you still have the same issues. You know, the, the great coach that stuck with a mediocre student, but he could turn that mediocre student, in, if they have the discipline, into a great yeah. player. You know, and somebody has a super talent over here that's lazy and can't win the big one. You know what I mean? Doesn't show uh, up know. to training. Thinks they know yeah, it all. Take the, yeah, doesn't follow the nutrition. or just. You know, very you know. rarely do you have a Roy Jones Jr. Roy Jones mm-hmm. Jr. was a guy that, in my opinion, was not – fully skilled you know technique wise and like what i would say a complete boxer i can't show him to a kid and say imitate that and you're okay because unless that kid has his genetics none of that's gonna work that is true you know because so here here's a guy born with these super athletic genetics and was trained early on for boxing so those athletic skills translated to a boxing ring but he also had the discipline the man worked out very hard and you know i mean that's why even though he slowed the pace and started getting hurt later in his in his career he still had a long 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 career how long was his career 20 something years that's a long time for a pro boxer oh yeah and another fighter who we just seen canelo What, what got canelo where he's really at today discipline discipline yeah Hard work. Up until like three fights ago, he wasn't that yeah. outstanding. You, you, the Canel- Canelo is a, is a, you know, I don't, you know, not trying to knock nobody, but his coaches, his, I don't call them teachers because they've learned with him. Mm. They're learning with him, in my opinion. Okay. And he's loyal to them, and that's a beautiful thing. But had he had a Nacho Berestein in his corner, you know, three, four, five years ago, He'd be even he, another he'd be level. Ahead, he'd be ahead of schedule. He'd be another level. Mm-hmm. What's the difference between a coach at that level and the ones that are there? Okay, I'll, I'll put it in cars. There we go. Okay. Chevys and Fords have no problems letting you see the screw. Go find a screw on a Mercedes. You know what I mean? You know, everything's been polished and cleaned and looks, looks like it's supposed to. You know, there's no, they don't miss anything. When you teach somebody properly... You know, that's what the difference is. You know, it's like it's it's been groomed. It's been polished. fucking dressed. It's polished mm-hmm. and cleaned up. That's why they call it polishing a fighter. You know, there are certain trainers uh, or teachers, cornermen, whatever you want to call them, that they were just considered polishers because they never worked with amateurs. In the old days, pro fighters, uh, pro teachers, pro cornermen never worked with an amateur. You know, it was like there was no... Like, Emmanuel was one of the ones that broke the mold of being an amateur, you know, trainer that moved on with the pros with his guys, you know. Most of the times, it was two different worlds, you know, two different, you know, the amateur trainers were known in their world and the pros guys, like an Angelo Dundee, for example. He was not a creator of fighters. He was a polisher. You know, he'd get you and he'd, okay, well, you need to do this and this, you know, your style. Once you're made. Yeah, you know. And so what happens with a guy like that? He's not a great creator of that ultimate technique either. Because he's dealing with guys that are already set in a certain style, and he can't change what they got. That's the tough part, right, when you bring those polishers in. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, because they just make you do the best you can do with what you've already got. With what you have. You know? Mm -hmm. But you get somebody like Nacho Berestein, and if you get a young fighter with a guy like that, you're going to get, from the floor up, a beautifully skilled, you know, the, the way they teach... You know, I don't agree with everything they do, but for the most part, defensively, um, what's his face? Uh, Ricardo Lopez. Who's That's who from, I was just thinking. You, know, you he, took R- his Ricardo, name out of my yeah, mouth. He's That's from one that of my school. favorite. If if I have a fighter that I could set out there as an example of technical boxing, every punch, it's him, Ricardo, Ricardo Lopez. Lopez. You know, and that guy, his first two months in the gym, you know what he did? What? His coach, which was... The precursor to Nacho, which was Cuyo Hernandez, who was a manager of, and uh, he was more of a manager of fighters, but he was a brilliant boxing guy, you know. And he early worked with a, a, a very famous coach named Kid Rapides, and later Nacho came under under his wing too. 
Nacho got to work with Ricardo Lopez early on, too. It was all the same little gym, you know. Two months, every day, a couple hours, all he did was stand in front of the mirror and slide forward with a couple, with a couple punches and slide backward with his jab. I mean, basically just working his jab with his footing. They call that learning how to walk. <coughs> and, and I say two months, it's not that much. No. It's not to that much. Get a kid to do that you now. You could spend four months, six months, so what? But, but, but when you perfect that, watch out. When you get in, in the position of that fighter yeah. at that it, moment. It reminds he, me of the movie Karate Kid. Wax on, wax off. It's like, it makes no sense. Well, it's but when you utilize it, it's, it's, it's the mind. You know, sometimes it's like, sometimes it's not even that it actually does anything for you. But just the mental conditioning of you doing something that the other guy's not going to do. It becomes second nature. Mm-hmm. It, you know, these are building Instantly. blocks to yourself. These are building blocks. Like, why am I doing this? It doesn't matter. You're building something. The, the ability to stay focused on something even when it doesn't make sense to you. Sometimes you're in a fight and things ain't working, man. But you got to keep working something because eventually it will work. You know? Discipline. And you, you the train timing, f- the skill all comes together. Yeah, and some of those things you, you can't just teach them by fighting because these kids every time they get into a hard sparring they're getting hurt oh yeah so it's a breakdown versus a build up so you have to find other ways of creating the discipline and the character inside that guy that'll make him do that extra punch and that extra round if he has to you know um, it's you know there's a lot to it well I mean uh, I you guys have worked with a lot of different fighters and and you understand the science and to get a young man or woman to want to go in and fight seems like that's coming from their heart. And a lot of people go in, it's like, I'm going to take karate. They get their butt kicked now, like, I'm done with karate. I'm going to go play tennis. You know. And so what percentage that you've seen had potential and walked away because they didn't have the ganas or the ability to endure going through the beginning of the disciplinary stages? I don't know the percentage, but I know this, that that's why you don't put the students... To spar right away. Mm-hmm. You teach them the fundamentals. You build on that. You start doing, um, you practice with them back and forth on the punching, back and forth on the punching, where you little by little start develop their confidence to where they could start doing those moves by instinct mm-hmm. to start sparring. A lot of people, they throw them right in right away. Let's see yeah. what you got. Yeah. Well, they don't have anything. They just showed up. Yeah. And you know then what you saying? then you've got the kids. They're discouraged. Well, there in, are the old, ki- in the old days, there was a reason for that, though. See, <clears throat> when you're in the gym every day and you're the one that's out there training these kids or, or adults, even you know. Now there's there's an abundance of of students, but not for competition. There's a bunch of people. Uh, there's a lot of boxing going on in the gyms today, but not for competitive reasons. There's a lot of people want to learn boxing. But you go back prior to the 80s, the busier it got, the more you had some of this. Kid comes into the gym, first day, they put him in with the toughest kid in the fucking gym. Oh, man. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? That kid's going to get his ass kicked. Well, the old trainer's mentality, which is brutal, was, well, if he comes back tomorrow, he's worth teaching. Ha! <laughs> that was it. Because they didn't want to get the time wasted with a guy that was going to quit in the big picture. When of the all. things get tough, right? You know? yeah. So they wanted to make sure they got a dog that won't quit. You know what I mean? That's the mentality. You know, hate to put it in that old fashioned analogy, but that's how I feel when I'm talking about the old fashioned guys. That's how I, I was. You want to make sure you got a guy that won't quit when it, when it comes down to it. That guy that comes the next day with his face feeling like shit really wants it. He's worth teaching, you know? Got but. Heart. but but that's fucked up because somewhere in maybe one out of ten, of, you know, these kids that did, you know, say, fuck that. I ain't going back to that was a kid that if you taught him right, he would have built that courage. It's just like war. The first time people experience a front line battle, most of them retreat. That's why we switched in teaching in boot camps to live rounds, because we found out that in a few wars, our front lines of you know newly experienced soldiers would usually cower. Russia, Germany, they had a line behind the front line to shoot those guys. So those guys knew 
They didn't cower because they knew that there was a guy behind him ready to shoot him if he, ret if he retreated. Why would they do that? Because it's human nature. Self-preservation. It's a very What's that fight it's or a flight? very it's a very human thing. Mm -hmm. You know, now if it takes an acquired, you know, an acquirement to get an acquired taste for a shot of tequila, how about a shot to the jaw? You know what I mean? It's it's, it's, yeah. it's you know, you got to build that. Like for me, I like getting my students in there and letting them start with body sparring. So they get the contact without getting their brain scrambled because you know, I see some of these people teach, and like he says, they put them right in there. It's not fun at that point, man. It's survival. Oh. That's, you know, it, it's, it should be fun. It's serious. You know, the, 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 the self-defense system of boxing should be taken serious. Okay. But it should also be fun, you know. If you're in there your first days and you're getting your head scrambled and you're going home with headaches, man, and, you know, you're getting your face rearranged for something you might not even do as a profession, I mean, even if you're going to do it for a profession, why just let your nose get broken for nothing? You know, it's not going to prove anything. It's your breathing apparatus, man. You need that fucker. You know, when <laughs> you I was know? a kid, I wanted to take boxing. I mean, I've been fighting my whole life, but I wanted to take boxing to learn the proper, what is it, Marcus of Queensbury rules, blah, blah, blah. But it was so expensive as a kid. We didn't have money. So we did the ghetto thing. We went into the garage with gloves. And my motorcycle helmets, hey, vamonos. <laughs> and you could swing as hard as Those you want. Those good headgears. Oh, yeah. bro, they, good. I, my, one of this, this guy came from Chicago, thought he's a tough guy. He puts the helmet on, and he went flying across the room. He's like, welcome to our world. Because in the street, it's like you gotta, you got to make it count because there might be more than two. But uh, I know that cost can be something that people may want to do it because they feel it will give them a sense of pride or accomplishment or whatever. And, so for those people watching that have kids that are interested, what would, would you guys recommend for the kids that are interested? Go to school. Play the guitar. <laughs> How about the piano? <laughs> no, you, 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 know, you know, I think boxing to build character. See, I'm not for boxing for competition, and I'll tell you why. That's where it got lost. That's where the invaders slipped in because boxing once upon a time was simply a self-defense system that people took the skills and competed, you know, for money, that's a whole separate issue. The essence of it was a self-defense system. Nowadays, it's like you can't walk into a gym and try to get a real coach to work with you unless you're going to compete. Yeah. They don't even want to deal with you unless you're paying big money, you know, or you're competing. And in the old days, that wasn't the way. They Every kid got... Got a and, shot, yeah. You know, I mean, they had it in school, I mean, public schools. Teddy Roosevelt, our, one of our greatest presidents ever, in my opinion, he said, boxing and wrestling, one-on-one -on -one sports, are great for character. We need them in every school in America, and he made that happen. That was you know? tough, man. I did the, the wrestling. Oh, my God. I did. Best too. shape I was ever in in my That's life. Right. And, and, right. and when you have, when, like, I grew up in an environment, you know this, you know, my brother was into the gangbang scene. So, you know, me being a younger brother, I sort of followed Big Brother into that world, even though by nature the ring had taught me one-on-one, -on -one, man. You know, and it's funny because all of the other people that came from the boxing gyms had the same mentality. None of us were ever group people. We were never like, I'll get my buddies. It's just one-on-one, yeah. -on -one. let's do That's this, it. you know. I was taught this. You fight in school, you don't come back to the gym. That's tough. That was good, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was planted in me yeah. at about 14 years old. Right away. Any of you fight, don't come back here. We're not promoting that. Yeah, and, and, and that's that was not something, what it's about. That was something that was good. Yeah. But they yeah. don't, you know, it's like, it's tough when you're a kid, because now you feel you, you're a little cockier because you know... That's right, you and you're working like out, and you're feeling strong. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but at the same time, see, you, 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 you think that... And that does happen to very low, like, ignorant kids, you know. And, and that usually has to do more with their parenting than the kid itself. Most of the kids get their satisfaction and understand real quick the real competition's in the gym. That's right. That's where you're going to come and, and fight. And, and, if and, you want to fight, come here. Yeah. yeah because you know, we'll find a fighter for you. You feel feisty? Come on down. And, and you know, the real kids, uh -huh. the, you know, the kids that, 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 for the most part, 
once they get a taste of that, they don't care about the street fights. You know, it's That's just right. it's another thing. I mean, mm-hmm. I only fight as a kid because I was usually caught up in my brother's dramas. It was I, the neighborhood too. I mean, you know, and and I played hero for the kids. I hated bullies. That's so I you, played baby. hero a whole lot as a kid. I was like the Fonz at every school I went to. You know, pick, you know, I was, you know, sticking up for Richie Cunningham. You know what I mean? It's like, but I did the but, same. Man. But, but as far as for me was myself, the right thing to do. It's part of your character. Yeah, you, you know, know. I mean, it's, that's, it's it's that's good stuff, man. It's it's not something that you know you take lightly because you get a little bit of skill in that gym and you understand real quick what you could do on the streets. You know, there's all these people want to talk about like, oh, it doesn't work on the streets. Man, listen, I'm from the streets. Let me tell you, I'll tell you what works, you know. And if you've got some decent hand skills, basic structure of boxing, it's going to give you a big lead. Can you win every fight? No, but it's going to give you one hell of a jump start. So, Hector, so... When uh, when we Tootie and I were working together in different projects, and we'd walk, and there was this thing that would happen. People would start trouble all the time. <laughs> yeah. And Arturo had this thing where he would look a certain way, his head would turn, and all of a sudden somebody falls. So we always, <laughs> when he got the look, we had to have somebody ready to catch whatever was falling. <laughs> and it was not like, hey, man, I'm, it was no words. It was just like, boop. Yeah. And another one bites the dust, you know, it goes hey, out the you, back you door. Carry you know, him out you know the way. Who, who did it? I, I don't even like mentioning his name. You know, not not a very respectable cat, but John Engbeck. Yeah. I hit a guy in Concord at we were working a club. I was there. You were there, right? <laughs> yeah. John caught him in the air. I was like, because he was ready. He's yeah. like, he knew it was going to, he was like, oh, he's going to hit him. So he, before the guy hit the floor, he like, he scooped him. He scooped him so up. So he wouldn't hit, his head hey, wouldn't hit the floor. He so saved he, him. <laughs> well, you know, actually, he did save them because had they stayed, and they acted stupid and continued, it wasn't going to end well at the end of the night with other people. At least this was a merciful uh, yeah, night event. night. You know? <laughs> yeah, I always try to avoid it, though. I believe yeah. in the verbal judo, you know, where you yeah. know you talk to everybody, but that particular place, you remember why we went there, right? Oh, yeah. It Th- this Band- place, Banda night. It's still there. It's yeah. still there. And that place, <laughs> oh, man, let me tell you something. That, that was one one. Like you could talk to people about clubs at that time. Wolf Wolf Brothers Security had some of the security and some of the toughest clubs in Oakland. You know, with brothers and stuff, right? You know, that's a lot of cartel cats over there. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? At least back then, I don't know what's happening now. You know, mm-hmm. but back then there was like a crews that were heavy from Mexico, and they would literally have like five or six guys over here, five or six guys over here. Now all of these guys are packing. Thousand dollar boots with the cowboy and, and, hats, and they're trying to outdo each other and buy the whole place around the drinks. I mean, you know, around the drinks for the house, and you know, we got two, three hundred people. You know how much money that is. So the owner don't want to kick these guys out, but they're starting fights every fucking weekend. So the cops come and say, "We're shutting your shit down, man. You got just too many incidents here. This is going to shut down." So we were the crew that they'd bring into these places as a last ex- resort. To you know, pacify. Like, like yeah. how they made the movie yeah. Roadhouse and all yeah, that stuff. That was, that was, that was us. You that know, was we'd, we'd go in to clean up a place when there was no, you know, there was no other resort. The way. Those were interesting times. Yeah, yeah. But that's a different, you know, it goes back to boxing in some twisted way. Those problems would start when people would be disrespectful for no reason. They called it losing face. Yeah. So now there's a phone call made. You got four to six cars, four deep. These guys get out with machetes and yeah. stuff. And I tell the police, okay, we'll handle it. And we did. And nobody went to the hospital. It was cool. Oh, I almost did. You know, <laughs> when, when it was me and, uh, me and, uh, oh, man, I can't remember his name right now. He was one of my best friends there. Uh, um, Freeman. Freeman. Yes, Freeman, man. I, that was I mean, Twice the size of a refrigerator. Yeah, me, me and Freeman are, are working. And uh, a brawl breaks out, and it was just me and him that night. And it was at least a twenty brawl, twenty person melee, like ten on ten. These guys are going at it, right? That's a good odd. So, so we start breaking it up in a parking lot. You know, and it was funny because Freeman went on an alcoholic binge because of this night. Because Freeman was so fucking strong. He backhand dudes like Hercules shit and knock them out. Well, this night, some of them were getting back up, right? I'll get into that after. But so we're, we're hitting all of these dudes, right? And we're, you know, we're fighting all of these guys and we're calming it down. 
And all of a sudden, man, and I, you know, I was doing the old one two on a few. I, we, bodies were dropping. Put it that way. Me and Freeman are dropping these guys like fucking, like it, it was a video game. Boom, 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 boom. Next thing you know, man, I just felt something across my back. It hit me in the back with a bat. Oh, to this day, my back's back. My back has problems over it. You know, it hit me right, right above the waist, right in the lower back. Oh, oh. And I was on the floor, like legs weren't working. Come on. They weren't working. And this dude comes over my fucking head, and he's ready to, to hit me with the bat right on the head, like straight on. Clear. He's not going to miss. And I'm sitting there going, fuck. Yeah, I mean, it's just one of them fuck moments, you know. All I can do is just put my arms up, hope they don't break my arms, and, you know, see if I get some cover to my head. All of a sudden, he's in the air, and Freeman's using him like a gong on a car door with his head. Bing, bing, bing. Freeman saved my ass that night, you know. So, so uh, I remember I couldn't, I couldn't get up right away. And some, some ladies like, he can't move, he can't move. And they, and they called the ambulance. Oh. And it was funny because for about five or ten minutes, man, I'm not moving, man. I'm sitting there yeah. with my legs and Freeman's like, you all right? And I'm like, man, I can't move. And I'm sitting there going, fuck, I'm fucking paralyzed. But when I heard them sirens, I suddenly <laughs> sudden like, I saw God. <laughs> Started thinking eight hundred dollar uh, trip for just a trip, and then I'm sitting there going, "How much is this going to cost?" So I was like, "No fuck, well, that. I want those, <laughs> well, I want those," <laughs> you know. But but yeah, that was that you know you know one of them situations where you know what do you do? Boxing skills work to a certain. So point. circling back yeah. to boxing skills work. Yeah, well, they worked until the bat came. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> you didn't see. Yeah. yeah, you know, but but you know, look. I mean, for, for for somebody to come to self defense, like this happens a lot. It's girls, more more women right now want to do boxing than men. You know, I mean, you go to any boxing gyms, there's a lot of chicks in there doing it, and yeah. and, and then guys get all bashful, like they're scared to show the girls that they you know ain't got the skills. You know, so it's weird. It's a trip to see in all these gyms. It's like there's more girls doing it, but for 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 a woman, I recommend. If it's actually really about self defense, I recommend jiu jitsu first. A, a That's base. A great workout. The, well, it's not about the workout here. We're talking about self defense. We're talking about a situation where she's in a car at a, at a mall going to a car. It's dark. A guy tries to grab her to rape her. She, she can lock him up. She punches him in the nose. She mm -hmm. might just piss him off. Mm -hmm. No matter what her skills are, she might look like the baddest broad on Instagram hitting the mitts. But she punches some big 250-pound guy in the nose, and he wants to rape enough. her. Piss her, up, piss her All off. he's going to do is get excited. You know what I mean? Oh, really? Oh, you sexy thing? You know, that's not going to work. But if she's got some decent background and, you know, some basic skills in, in jiu-jitsu, she's going to know how to control his hips when he's trying to get at her. And he might tie her out from her controlling him. You know, it could happen. It's yeah. more of a possibility for that. Now, are there some girls that can knock out a guy, you know, if they're similar size or even bigger guys? Yes. Possibility. But but law of probability, no. Law of probability, yeah. they'll have a better chance if they have a skill in grappling where they could tie him up and he gets tired. The only way he's going to outdo that is if he has the skills in grappling. And your average pedophile, or well, not even pedophile, already. your average rapist, you know, they're not they're not out there doing jujitsu classes, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, but I do recommend, you know, also learning after that a little bit of punching, you know, from real boxing teachers, not from the MMA teachers, because MMA shows us this every weekend when they have the fights. Them guys do not know how to punch. People you know? want to be fit, and so they find something that they, they feel good makes them feel good. Mm -hmm. So I, I know people like uh, Solorio, one of your... Uh, Christina, yeah. Christina, who, sh she's great. Yeah. But she it's a lifestyle of being healthy, and they'll do that, they'll do something else, and they're always looking for staying healthy yeah keeps yeah. your mind sharp yeah. relationships you know it's like it's, there's balance it's well, right you know it's an it's thousands of years ago they said you know sound of body sound of mind and sound of mind sound of body you know yeah. works both ways you know the, yeah. the greeks said it two three thousand years ago you know but going back to 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 i want to hear what would you have had jacobs do differently with, with canelo I would have had him shooting a jab with authority. I would have worked him out in the gym. Yes. He was them, them measuring. Two, three months. He was measuring. Throwing a stiff yeah. jab with authority. 
to keep you at distance yeah. and to hurt you at distance, yeah. not just kind of paw he was, at he was, you. He was measuring yeah. with it, not you kind of paw. It. You, you know, you're really like just saying, uh, "Let me keep you right here at this distance, and so maybe I could hit you with a right hand." Yeah. All right. No, he could have controlled the fight with a nice strong jab in his movement, yeah. and right. then when he found the moment, hit him with the right hand yeah. or the hook. Yeah. But the, but the, he had the he had the tool. He just didn't know how to use it and use it. Yeah, the other it's thing a coaching too. Thing. Yes. The, yeah, he's he's lacking he's la- another he's level. La- of, he's lacking the basic fundamentals yeah. of boxing. Like, like that's what's sad. There was there was shots that he was throwing the jab and Canelo would counter with the jab. This is a very basic drill that I teach. It, 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 it mm. I didn't invent it. It's an old drill for boxing. You know, it's the catch and throw. You catch the shot and you return fire as fast as possible because what's going to happen in a real fight exactly that because yeah. when you extend your hand you open the door so to speak from one side because you should have the other hand nice and high guarding the other side but you're opening the door when you extend one hand to throw a shot okay so at that split second your opponent has an open door what's the best shot to throw against the jab well an overhand right or a counter jab and Canelo was counter jabbing him where it would hit him flush on it. So that means he was never taught to catch and throw. To, to so simply... that's interesting because if one has the reach and he was still able to land a jab, then. Well, the, the other side is that he spoke it. on earlier about Jacobs not standing sideways. Mm. So he's throwing his shots. Now his feet are sideways, but his waist is what we call squared up. Oh, so he was. Okay. So 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 he's not getting the full capacity of reach that's possible from his stance because he shortened it by turning his waist in a way that he has less reach. I remember seeing Arguello, and he had long arms. Sideways. Man, Sideways. That guy hit my... That's why his punches were snappy. Yeah, because he had reach. Okay. They were like and slingshots. More reach. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. He had reach Very and then more snappy. reach. There you go. Yeah. You know, Who was and, his coach? His coach, I forget at the moment. He was an unknown Nicaraguense coach that never, you know, really made a lot of dents over here, but uh-huh. was obviously very good because he polished uh-huh. him very well. Yes. I can't remember who his, his, what his name was. But later, uh, uh, Eddie Fudge worked with him. Yeah, he, you know, he and, did. And, and, uh-huh. and, you know, but that's a polisher at that point. Uh-huh. But see, when, you, when I always look at reach because I remember when Arguello would fight with certain people, they always said his reach. And the reach man, he had that. It was like it was. It would. But, but, it it was, but the reach doesn't it matter if you don't know how to use it. Reach, he knew exactly. how to use it. Yeah. If you have to know, having reach and know how to use it gives you more extended yeah. reach. Well, he yeah. did. He, uh-huh. he knew no, how to use he it. Did know. I'll tell you something that he had that that even Canelo today doesn't have. Jacobs definitely didn't have it, and that's the snap. You know, I mean, he knows. If you look at Arguello, we talked about Ricardo Lopez. Arguello looks like a larger yes, Ricardo yes, Lopez. Yes. You know, like today, uh, the mitts wow. are used mostly for, for, you know, mitts have like taken over in boxing as far as like one of the main tools for fighters to work out on. And that's ruined the punching because you can't learn how to snap on the mitts, especially when you have a mitt holder who meets the mitt. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. and, you know, no yeah. mitt holder, no matter how good, I'm a very good mitt holder. But I'm still not perfect enough to have it perfect for you Let to measure. Let the punch reach the yeah, mitt. Yeah, you, Don't meet each other. Yeah, so you, that's the key. The yeah, punch has to meet, meet the mitt. Yeah, well, because when you're fighting your opponent, is your opponent's face coming at the mitt? No. Or are you going to go meet He's most find likely going to go the other way, trying right. to avoid your... Yeah, he's uh-huh. gonna, so, so, so what happens when you're learning how to punch properly, when you, would, you also have to learn the time and the distance of where to create that snap where to extend to the perfect level of the maximizing of your Where you power. get the full extension of the punch, yeah. the reach, because right at the end, because the power's at, the, at about the last two inches of yes, the extension. Yes. You That's know, where the most power's hey, at. Hey, look, I, I, I'll do the metaphor to weed, right? <laughs> I, as, we, so, as we come down to the last few minutes. For, for all you guys out there that grow weed, here's a metaphor, <laughs> right? Sorry. Like purple. Purple was a big thing for a long time. Everybody wanted to have that purple weed, but it never looked fucking purple. You know why? Because most of these growers are killing it two weeks short. And those are the two weeks where it turns fucking purple. It's the same thing with maximizing a punch. 
you, if, if you shortchange it by a millimeter, you fucked off. You know, the snap is something you learn on the heavy bags. Be, I, man, I seen Lupe Pintor walk into Newman's, right? He was already retired. He walked up to the bag. He's a little guy, man. He threw a couple combinations just plain. And it cracked like lightning and hit the fucking bag. Crack. You know, you've heard when fighters, when they got that fucking that snap, man. Ricardo you know, Lopez. What is he? 112, 118 yes. pounds. Okay, but yeah. let me tell you something. When he's in a, an arena throwing punches, you hear all them yeah. punches yes. landed harder than, the than big some boys. heavyweights. Yeah. yeah. Because snap. it snap, snap, snap yeah. Yeah. every punch. Yeah. It, it, you know, like you don't even hear commentators today mention the snap. And you can go back on YouTube and listen to commentators from the 70s and 60s. And the first thing they'd say, He's starting to lose his snap. Uh, it was a sign of fatigue on a fighter. Because every fighter had, I mean, like Ali. His, you know, it was the snap. Larry Holmes, he'd snap that jab at your head. Oh, talk about jabs, you know. Mm -hmm. But Any last words on what Canelo should have done? Well, I think he did very well to stay safe throughout the whole fight. And had he risked a little more, maybe he would have been caught. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. He did what he had to do yeah. to stay safe and finish off the fight victoriously. Do you think if he would have trained to go a little bit lower, it would have done better for him? Because he was right on the surface of those shots, but not under. And I mm -hmm. thought that he missed a lot of attack that he would have created. But, but, but if he would have been a little lower, maybe he would have shortened his reach. But he would have made him uh -huh. open up so he can come up and hook a la yeah. Tyson. Uh -huh. And... Know? and um, but but one thing about Jacobs, he kept his guard and his yes. elbows in yes, kind of tight, Very so he tight. was kind of hard to oh, yeah, get his arm into. Was straight, uh -huh. everything, yeah, yeah. So he was a yeah. little difficult yeah. to get that target. Yeah. And but Canelo did what he could with what he had in front of him. So what do you think of Canelo in the future? Do you think he's going to improve? You think he's got more to grow? I think he's already improved. Um, I think he has some room to improve um, because he's willing to keep learning. I think that. Him fighting Mayweather has really opened up his eyes, and he's already seen the improvement that he's improved now. Right on. So hopefully he could learn things that he didn't learn with Mayweather, and he yeah. could just develop off that. Yeah, I think he's doing it little by little. Mm -hmm. But we got to go, and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks, heck, for being here. I wish you'd be here every week if you want to come. Thank you, guys. Right on. Adios. Adios. <laughs>